Pentecost. Um, just so you know, we're intentionally <laughs> streaming through Mevo this morning because part of the sermon is going to be interactive. Guess what that means? You have to talk at that point. <laughs> and the mic, the system that's in here will pick up more sound than the one that goes through our streaming software, which will only pick up the mics. So as I asked last week and have talked with today is one of those strange days that they designate as Grandparent Day. And I know many people here are grandparents and so we're going to celebrate that a little bit. And I've asked you to come up with stories, not make-believe stories, but real stories about your grandkids. And I will ask you to share that in the midst of the sermon. So keep thinking about that. And I have gifts for everybody on the way out. Kind of letting you all know about that. Things going on around here. Um, announcements have been out. Erin will be not always working in the office um, for a little while, so I invite you, if you need to get in touch with her, send an email to her office email, since so she can pick it up and get back with you quickly. I'll be in the office when I don't have meetings too, but just kind of bring that to your attention. I have not written anything else down on my make sure to say thing, but are there things you all would like to share with one another as we gather this morning? Well, I don't see anybody raising hands. So I'm going to ask you to take just a few moments and to prepare your hearts for worship. I would invite you to stand as you were able and to join me in the confession and forgiveness. 
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who teaches, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sin. Amen. I'm going to take a time for some of our kids who may be joining us online and invite those of you who are here to have a seat. Good morning, gather around. Hopefully you can see, maybe you can get a little closer. Now I've been back in school for two weeks. How's it going? Learning anything? Hope so. I brought some stuff with me this morning. A, B, C. How do you think I figured out how to write that? Do you think somebody just, that I just went, Oh, I'll pick up a pen and write it. Somebody taught me how to write A, B, C. I remember my mom helping me with that, but I mostly remember in school with crayons, learning to write A, B, C. I also remember, I think I was in first grade, and they had these cool notebooks that you use a really funky pen with, and it turned colors if you wrote the letter correctly. I thought that was the neatest thing. So I had very straight letters so that my pen would work. My parents, my mom especially, and teachers in school helped me learn my ABCs. A little bit later in life, I went to college and I learned to write different ones. Do you know what that says? Guess what? It's the ABCs, kinda. It's the ABCs in Hebrew. And you know what's even weirder? It doesn't read like this. It reads like this. It's Aleph, Beit, Gimel. A, B, G in Hebrew. Again, I didn't just learn that out of nowhere. I had a really fun teacher who taught me how to write and read Hebrew. I even learned some fun songs that I can sing in Hebrew. Okay, I won't sing them. I promise. A little while later, when I was in college, I learned my ABCs a different way. Stay. I learned these ones. Funny looking letters again, huh? But again, it's ABCs or Alpha, Beta, Gamma. A, B, G, because that's the ABCs in Greek. Had a real staunch teacher who taught me Greek. And that's good because it's a really kind of mm -hmm language. But I've been thinking about all the people who taught me things through the years, especially as we start a new school year, and how they changed my life. Today we're going to read a lesson where Jesus is teaching. And the disciples don't really like what he's teaching them. Do you have a favorite subject? See, I love science and math. Really wasn't quite fond of history. And I was really horrible at art. But they didn't like what Jesus was teaching them. That he was going to suffer and die and rise again. And so they tried not to hear that. But Jesus kept helping them understand those things and what it meant for them. And I thought about Jesus being a teacher. And what he teaches us as he teaches us to love and to trust and to believe in him 
that he would take all of the things in life that we do that aren't good upon himself and free us from them. So as you experience teachers and you experience all kinds of teachers and just not the ones you go to school with, your parents are here at church, maybe you play a sport or you dance and you have coaches that help you learn those things, that you remember Jesus who teaches you about love and grace and that you are special in God's eyes. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for being that teacher, even when what you're teaching us we don't really like or want to hear. Help us be good teachers for others as we share the things we know with maybe somebody that doesn't know how to do them so that they can grow and especially grow to come and love you. Thank you for people, for teachers of all sorts. We ask all things, God, as it is in accord with your will, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite us to join in our opening hymn, and please, if you are able, stand. Call us to community through Christ. Out of our brokenness, 
you call us to wholeness and new life in the spirit. Out of our confusion, you call us to wisdom and understanding, O oh God. From wherever we are, we come in praise and thanksgiving. Hear us as we proclaim glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, through suffering and rejection, you bring forth your salvation. And by the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel, we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Good morning. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 to 9a. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. Morning by morning he awakens, awakens my ear to this as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Psalm is on 16, verses 1 to 9. I will start with the right print if you will please respond with the bold print. I love the Lord who has heard my voice, and I listen to my supplication. And listen to my supplication, for the Lord has given ear to me whenever I call. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grief hung on me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord watched over the innocent. He was brought low, I was brought low, and God saved me. Turn again to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt well with you. For you have rescued me, my life from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. I walk in the presence of the Lord, in the land of the living. The second reading is from James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes, is speaking, is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with the bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small rudder, <coughs> yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. 
With it we bless God, the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does the spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you're able for the reading of the Gospel. It is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then he, Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake, and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. Who do you say that I am? Perhaps Jesus' most recognized question, and perhaps also one of his most quoted ones. Jesus is well into his ministry in Galilee and around, and around Jerusalem by the time we get to this text in Mark. So it seems only logical that he start kind of trying to figure out why are these people really sticking around him? It hasn't granted been that long ago since he called them, but even the most warmest of fuzziest of feelings starts wearing off unless you have something meaningful to hang on to. It only takes a few uncomfortable situations or questions to start plaguing you to wonder, am I really up for this? So Jesus has this identity discussion with the group. What you heard on the streets about me? And he says, but who do you say that I am? And for the first time, one of the disciples seems to get it. At least he uses the right words. You're the Messiah. And I wonder, did Jesus smile at hearing that name applied to him by the one he cared for so dearly? Did it kind of warm his divine heart that they were finally getting it? Obviously, we don't know for sure. What we do know is that even though Peter uses the title Messiah for Jesus, he doesn't yet fully understand what that means. And Peter's not willing to have a Messiah die and suffer. That's not what Messiahs do. Titles, whatever they are, carry expectation. They carry baggage, and if you're going to use them, then you better be willing to accept all that comes with them. Jesus didn't seem to understand this. So Peter wants to take it upon himself to kind of bring Jesus up to speed so that he doesn't make another misstep. But it turns out that Jesus is the one who brings Peter up to speed on how this Messiah thing is going to work. 
regardless of what his or other people's perceptions and expectations are. Time to redefine what it means to be Messiah. That's not just the title Messiah that carries expectations, that brings baggage with it. Think about the images that pop into your head as I use such words as president, senator, terrorist, family, chaplain, homeless, grandparent. That picture that came into your head is based on your past experiences and how you've come to expect those people to look and act and be. And some of those pictures may be very positive and some not so much. Some may stir up anger in you and others will make you smile. Titles, whether we want to admit it or not, still carry a life of their own. Jesus' disciples struggle with him changing what they envisioned a Messiah to be. And that will be a recurring struggle throughout all of Jesus' earthly ministry, and even until, well, after he is resurrected. We don't change our minds very easily. If you notice, I included grandparent in that list, because as I mentioned last weekend, as we started today, it is grandparents' day. I was watching a TV show the other night where the cast of characters were trying to deliver a child's letter simply addressed to grandma and had an address on it. So they went to what ended up being a retirement village and talked to various groups of people and they asked each group as they got in front of it, who here was called grandma? Now you would think a bunch of hands would go up, wouldn't you? Or at least from the women. Okay, I get it that the guys wouldn't raise their hands. But it didn't. Most of the group, and I know it's all for TV, but most of the group said, oh no, I was never called grandma. I was called Mima or Mimi or Bubby. Nona or Oma or Yaya or Gigi or a whole host of other names. Well, finally they found a few that said, yeah, I was called grandma by my grandkids. Figured out which one was the recipient of the letter and gave it to her. Now, at first, I thought that was really unrealistic. But then I thought back of how many of my friends refused to be called grandma or grandpa. And it wasn't that they didn't want grandkids or they didn't want a relationship with them. They were excited for that next generation. It was rather they didn't see themselves as old enough to be grandpa. I can't possibly be a grandma, a grandma. So rather than challenge those expectations, that picture that was in their and many people's minds, they chose not to accept that title. Now admittedly for some it was a practical matter because with numerous blended families, you almost have to have a unique name for people so you know who you're talking about. But that wasn't the reason I heard most of them say they didn't want anybody calling them grandma or grandpa. Because that picture didn't match their reality. There was this one person though, that I thought if anybody was going to kind of push back on being called grandpa, it was him. He's about a year older than I am, and he is, well, let's see, Free spirit, I'll go with that one. I was trying to think of other ways to describe him, but he's just kind of, wah, what you get? So I thought, there's no way when his first grandkid came along, he's gonna allow anybody to call him grandpa. I was wrong, so wrong. He not only embraced the title, he went out and bought t-shirts for him and his son and the little baby, took pictures, blasted it all over his Facebook, and even now he has three, and they're still all over Facebook with, I'm a happy grandpa. And I'm like, I don't get it, but okay. 
If there was ever an unconventional image of grandpa, he's it. So I'm going to ask all of you here this morning who are grandparents, maybe even great-grandparents, how do you deal with that title? Does it feel like the honor it is? Have you redefined for yourself, and maybe even for others, what it means to be grandma or grandpa? As you are comfortable, and I hope only many of you are, First of all, I'd like you to share with what you ask your kids and grandkids to call you. And then share some story, some remembrance. Okay, let's face it, brag on your grandkids. Not 20 minutes, but a short story or a short remembrance. And help us celebrate what it means to be a grandparent. That's one of the reasons why we're using this, because it will pick up sound going on around the room. So. I know so many of so. You don't have to stand up, you don't have to cut the mic, just tell us. What <laughs> <laughs> about my grandkids? Yeah. And I'm Graham. And Bob is Baba. They came up with that. So Bob. Um Bob Bob, if you, you know Bob. I mean, he's a kid name, so kids run to him, and the grandkids run to him, and Grandma kind of got left in the corner. Oh. oh. Anyway, but Keegan came along, who will be 14 this year, Keegan came along, and when she was about three or four, we went to visit, and of course, Juniper ran to Bob Bob, and Keegan just went right by Bob Bob, and jumped in my arms, and I said, I rule. <laughs> oh, <love it. laughs> All right, I'll go. Okay. So, Bob is Papa Bob, and I am Grandma Vicky. And our son has been, well, we going, I lost track, six or seven times. So we've had our grandkids, uh, four grandkids, live with us twice. So. One of the things we, Bob and Papa Bob and I, learned to do very fast was to make sure we lock our bathroom doors. <laughs> <laughs> it was more shock for them than for us, but anyway. And then uh, one of my fondest memories with Gavin, who's the youngest one, was in this church because they, they go to church when they come to live with us. And it was a Christmas um, service, and he was six, and he started crying. I said, what happened? And this is so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every it really must be a bob thing. Right. I'm Grant, so this is Grim. <laughs> we have twin grandsons that are 21 and a half months old. Oh. We were asked, or we volunteered, <laughs> to babysit for a week, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Susan went back to teaching. Jared had to work his day shift at CPAC. In short, Darlene and I learned the meaning of it makes you tired just to watch them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's many that can relate to that. <laughs> story I can tell um, about my oldest grandson. I was working out of Eastern Oregon, uh, living in a camper during the week, coming home on the weekends, and I conned him into going with me. And of course, because I wandered around the brush all day, he thinks I have the job to die for. So he couldn't wait to go work with me for a couple of weeks. Well, we were on this particular John hunting down a, uh, a plot that we had to go measure. And we had been hitting wasps consistently all week long, going through the brush. And of course, he just comes on glued, and the wasp comes. And I 
Andrew standing there in the closet, you know, harasses him. So about the third day, me and my infinite wisdom yelled at him. Just stand there and they'll leave you alone. So, knowing that I knew everything, <laughs> he just stood there and it nailed him. Oh! <laughs> and the look on his face uh, to me, uh, let me know that if I'm going to make edicts, they better be right. <laughs> <laughs> I have. One man who lived in the dog, they don't like it. They just let me go on. They've all been confirmed here at the church. Uh, Carrie is one that sticks out in my mind. She is one that is so much like me growing up, but she learned when she went, graduated, and to go to school and looking for work. She wanted a job, she didn't have to talk to anybody. <laughs> so, for the last few years, she's been a checker at Safeway. And she now trains checkers. But also have an oldest friend out there that I'm proud of and talked to her last year of college. It went with one night, working days. And I'll have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice administration. And twin grandsons, too, that are senior in high school this year. My youngest grandkids. And my two youngest, three grandkids, or, as you tell, are four and almost two. And Tegan is the smart one. She don't like to talk with grandma or with mom. So she informed mom, I have family. So I get to stay with the man. <laughs> but we are grandma and grandma. I always been proud of the fact that we are grandma. I never needed to substitute it. Okay, well, we are grandma and pa. And uh, we have four grandchildren, two boys and two girls. The two boys live on, on the coast in Fort Angeles, and the two girls live in Spokane. And I guess the, the thing that um, I guess I've tried to uh, orchestrate throughout our grandparenthood is that they bond, that my that the cousins bond. And uh, we started out with uh, Christmas PJs all the same. So every Christmas we have matching pajamas. The, the kids get along so well. They they come together for all holidays. They came for two weeks this summer, and they get along so well, and that is an answer to my prayer, that they just love each other, they love the time that they spend together, and I have memories of cousins, but I wasn't as close to my cousins as these four are, and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Pause. Well, thank you for sharing your stories. They're amazing. They make us laugh. They make us go, aw. And each of you embody being a grandparent in a different way. And you're in great company as you do. Because it's pure gift. As a disciple of Jesus, you follow one who redefined what it means to be Messiah. And because of that, he changed the world. Jesus would not be that tyrannical overlord they were expecting, but because he wouldn't accept their expectations, he did indeed die, suffer, and was resurrected and changed the world because of that. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus not just freed people from their latest kind of occupation. He freed them from sin, death, and the power of the devil, and he gave them eternal life, and he does that for all of us who have a very special name, child of God. Jesus changed what it meant to be Messiah. So just as we who follow Jesus take up our cross and go out in his name, embrace whatever name it is that your grandkids call you. It is yours. 
It's a special relationship. And not everyone gets to have that title. You are blessed. Live it out with pride and honor because God has gifted you for just a time as this. As you know, I usually end each sermon with a prayer, and I'm, and I'm going to do that today, but it's going to be a little different because I want to pray for grandparents. And I'm going to use a prayer that was written. I forgot to look up who wrote it, but it's called Look in Love. And if you're sitting next to or near somebody who is in your household or who is in your bubble or however you want to talk about that, I am going to ask you to lay your hands on one another, grab each other's hands, whatever is comfortable for you, as we pray together and pray for grandparents. So let us pray. Look with love on grandparents the world over, holy God. Protect them. They are a source of enrichment for families and for all of society. Support them. As they grow older, may they continue to be for their families strong pillars of gospel faith, guardians of noble domestic ideals, and living treasuries of sound religious tradition. Make them teachers of wisdom and courage, that they may pass on to future generations the fruits of their mature human and spiritual experience. Help families and society to value the presence and roles of grandparents. May they never be ignored or excluded, but always encounter respect and love. Help them to live serenely and to feel welcomed in all the years of life which you give them. Keep them constantly in your care. Accompany them on their earthly pilgrimage. And by your prayers, grant that all families may one day be reunited in our heavenly homeland, where you await all humanity for the great embrace of life without end. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
are able, as we share our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all according to their needs. Revealing God. You have made yourself known through bread and wine, water and word. Continue to nurture your church, that we may be a place where your presence is experienced and shared. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Creating God, you brought life into being and called it good. Bring new creation to lands devastated by tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, fires, and other disasters. Restore forests and curb overflowing waters. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Protecting God, you desire all people to live in peace and safety. Provide for all who are in danger. Strengthen first responders to help meet needs in a complex society. And provide care and compassion as they too face trauma. Lord, in your mercy. Hope-filled God, you are with us even in the most challenging of times. As we marked the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks this weekend, our hearts were once again torn open. And yet we experienced your compassion and strength through that. Work through us that we may be instruments of real justice, not retribution, and healing in our ever-growingly divisive world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Transforming God, you announce release to the captives and freedom to the oppressed. Break chains of discrimination and injustice. Amplify voices that go unheard and inspire us to advocate for those who are often overlooked. Bring your healing presence to those who suffer, whether that's in mind or body or soul. Especially this day we remember in prayer, Lad, Jess, Keith, Linda, Aaron, John, Verna, Dave, Jenny, Emil, and all who are on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Forming God, you gather this community together. Shape our communal life that in our prayer, praise, and worship, we honor you and encourage one another, keep our disagreements civil, and increase our joy in working together. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I would invite you to share a sign of peace in a way that is comfortable for you and those around you.
stand as you are able. Let us pray. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love, you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The things of God for the gathered people of God. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. By the congregation to be seated, we again ask that you come through the center aisle and then return by the side aisles, placing your empty glasses in the um, baskets that are on the side aisles. This is Christ's table. All are invited to come and dine.
We invite you to stand as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. People of God, you are the body of Christ, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. We sing together our last hymn today, which is Lift High the Cross.